Heavy clashes have broken out in northern Afghanistan, with the Taliban saying they are pressing ahead with their offensive. A Taliban spokesman told the BBC that they were fighting government troops near the cities of mazar sharif in Balkh and Pulakhumri in Baghlan. The Taliban have rejected calls for a ceasefire despite international appeals. The militants have seized five provincial capitals in the last few days as foreign forces leave the country. The cities appear to have fallen within hours of each other. Here's our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams. Fire and confusion in the centre of Kunduz. Taliban pictures appear to show yet another city falling under their control. This is their biggest prize so far, a large city, economically and strategically important and it seems to have fallen easily. Afraid of the fighting as much as the Taliban, civilians are fleeing, some of them heading south for Kabul. A government spokesman says the Taliban will soon be ousted, but similar claims have been made elsewhere, apparently without result. To the west, Taliban fighters inspect newly captured government buildings in Saripol, another provincial capital one of three reportedly captured in just one day. The Taliban have now captured five provincial centers, as well as Sharipol and Kunduz. They now appear to control Zaranj, Shebagan and Talakan, no longer content to control the countryside, but confident enough to move on major cities. If the Taliban could make it to Kunduz, maybe they could make it to Kabul, and that in itself is a big fear. The only good option would be if there's some kind of a political settlement but that doesn't seem any more possible today than it did two or three years ago. And tens of thousands of Afghans are being displaced. This is not just a political and military disaster. Decades of conflict in Afghanistan have created whole generations of refugees. The West's military withdrawal is almost complete. Afghans fear they're being abandoned. The government can request American airstrikes, but for how long? And to what effect? Paul Adams, BBC News. Well, Chris Alexander is a former Canadian ambassador to Afghanistan who also served as a deputy special representative of the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan. He joins me now live from Denmark. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. Are you surprised at the sort of pace in which the Taliban seems to be moving in the country? Yes, I'm surprised that um, they are being, they, they are turning away from the fable of negotiations uh, towards the reality of a military offensive uh, on this scale. Uh, I think everyone is struck by the brutality of their actions. They're not just taking prisoners and uh, maiming or warning people that worked for the government. They're actually abducting and assassinating people on a large scale. Up to a thousand have been killed in Kandahar because they're alleged to have worked for the government. Uh, but on deep closer inspection, no one should be surprised because the Taliban have never abandoned their violent agenda. They really don't have a political program for Afghanistan. They are a military force uh, and they're finally returning to form. Uh, is it then naive of the international community to continue to call for some kind of peaceful political resolution to this conflict? It's never wrong to call for a peaceful resolution. Uh, I think it is now completely unreasonable to expect that political solution to come from Doha. The, the Taliban have violated every article of that agreement signed two years ago with the United States. Uh, among the leaders of the assaults on cities that the Taliban is undertaking have been those released uh, among the 5,000 prisoners that the U.S. insisted be released uh, on condition that they not return to the fight. They have returned to the fight. So the real question is, what are we going to do next? Uh, and here, I think the international community has to be very, very serious about next steps. This could become another Syria. This could become Afghanistan in the 1990s if our inaction continues. What is in fact happening is uh, an act of aggression, uh, a breach of the peace under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. The UN should and the international community should be able to take action, political and if necessary, military, to stop this.
Uh, you and we you say be it could be uh, another Syria. Are you concerned it could be another Rwanda or Srebrenica? Absolutely. I think what's happening today amounts to genocide uh, on to some extent in those areas where the Taliban have committed war crimes and atrocities. Uh, but we have to be clear about who the Taliban, who's behind the Taliban and who the Taliban are. Uh, there is not a serious expert anywhere who denies that this group is organically linked to and was in fact created by Pakistan's intelligence services. And so sanctions, political messages, condemnation should be directed towards that country. That is the step that has been avoided for far too long. It, it has, uh, Afghanistan it, is... It, you say it's been avoided. Why? Well, because for 10 years, the international community was determined to see negotiations work. And for two years, we had an agreement with the Taliban uh, that had some promise. I and many others would have said a very remote one from the beginning uh, to achieve success. It has not now achieved success. And the, uh, the Taliban's masters in Pakistan are pursuing uh, a military opportunity now that the U.S. and NATO forces are leaving. Uh, a military opportunity as they see it to impose their will on the country. Uh, they uh, need to Pakistan, finally call their Pakistan, bluff. of course, continues to deny this. Yes, and we can choose to accept those denials just as we can uh, choose to, ex as some choose to accept that human beings aren't responsible for global warming. warming. The reality is that pa Pakistan's ISI and Pakistan's army stand four square behind the Taliban. They are launching this invasion, they are prosecuting these attacks, and they deserve to face sanctions just as Vladimir Putin and his entourage have faced sanctions for their invasion of Ukraine, which they initially denied. We have to treat sovereign countries equally when there is a breach of the peace, when there is an act of aggression on this scale, the machinery of international law needs to go into motion. And here we have the UN Charter, Chapter 7. This is a classic case uh, where the international community needs to act against Pakistan to prevent this invasion but, 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 from going any further. But with the international further. community leaving, do you think there's there's a will? And, and apologies, we've got just a few minutes left, so just briefly. Uh, the Biden administration's policy towards Pakistan remains undetermined. I think there is an opportunity for the United States and other democracies to take a step that would be unprecedented, yes, but that would save Afghanistan from another dark chapter of, uh, of brutality. So uh, yes, uh, the political will needs to be summoned, but now is the time to do it. And I hear voices starting to speak up uh, for solutions that could actually work rather than this negotiation that has gone nowhere. Ambassador Alexander, thank you very much for your time here on the program.